Okay, we're rolling. We're interviewing uh, Mr. Norman Levine at uh, Latham headquarters, uh, March 21st, 2001. Michael Akey, interviewer. Wayne Clark, uh, videographer. Mr. Levine, where'd you grow up? In Poughkeepsie. Poughkeepsie. But I was born in Brooklyn. Okay. Uh, what was growing up in Poughkeepsie like? It was like any small town. I thought it was it was very good. Mm -hmm. uh, it was you know we had very little crime and everything else when I was a kid. It was a, it was a good town. And you went to school in Poughkeepsie. Yeah, yeah. graduated from Poughkeepsie High School. Okay. What was uh, Poughkeepsie High like back then? Well, I know I played football with the team, and uh, we had the best team in that whole area. I knew that. <laughs> and what did you do after high school? Then I went to, I got a job for, with the uh, utilities, Central, Central Hudson. Mm -hmm. uh, they, were doing a, they were doing construction, and they hired a lot of us kids there. We were, they, like 50 cents an hour and 75 for overtime. All the overtime you could you could you could use. This was what nineteen before the war, just before the war, right after I got out of high school, which would be 39, 30, 1939. And uh, a couple of times, I I made fifty dollars a week in one week. In those days, guys were making uh, seventeen and twenty, you know, with families. So I was very lucky in that respect. You were doing pretty well. At that time, yeah. You were a teenager. I had, I had so much money I didn't know what the hell to do with it. I gave my mother most of it, and I still had so much I didn't know what to do with it. And um, where were you when uh, Pearl Harbor? I was home. I had worked a night shift for Central Hudson. I'll never forget it. And I woke up in the morning, and I, you know, I'm ashamed to say it. My sister says to me, you know, they bombed Pearl Harbor. I had no idea where Pearl Harbor was. And I thought to myself, they were bombing China, you know, the Japs at that time. I said, it must be someplace in, uh, in China. Showed you how smart I was. Nine out of ten people who I've asked that question to, it's the same answer. Yeah. And what, were you, what did you think uh, when you heard that? When I, when, I, when I finally understood that it was, a, a, you know, our country, of course, I got very patriotic, and I joined up the next day. Why the Marine? Well, my dad was a Marine, and uh, he used to talk about it a lot. You know, mm -hmm. uh, they, he was on a board. He was on a board ship, a Seagull Marine, years and years ago, of course. And I don't know. It just sort of appealed to me. Plus the fact that at that time I was, like we used to say in the Marine Corps, gung ho. You know, you wanted to fight. <laughs> Before you even had a fight, you wanted to fight. <laughs> so where uh, where'd you go to boot camp? Paris Island. Paris Island. What was that experience like? Uh, it's pretty tough. It was pretty did, tough. Did you expect how tough it would be? Not really. Well, I tell you, the first the first morning we got aboard the train in New York City. Up until that time, it, we went in and signed up. And everybody was high doing. Blah, blah, blah. We got aboard the train, and a guy gets on the train and. That's not a scream. I hope you don't mind this. I don't know. Gonna re All right, you shit birds. You're in the Marine Corps now. I don't want to hear your goddamn voices. Holy Christ, everybody went into shock, you know. We hadn't been treated like this before. And it was like that all the way through to boot camp, you know, and they, nobody ever hit you or anything, but they, they certainly uh, abused you physically, or, you know, you know verbally. You know. So what do you think of all that? Well, you got to be proud of yourself after a while that you could take it. And then you got to b believe in that you were as tough as they told you were, which was very bad. <laughs> after boot camp, uh, where'd you go? I went to uh, New River, North Carolina. And you're going to have to be slow with me because I just had a stroke. So some take a little time to remember things. It's okay. And uh, what did you do at New River? I was in the in the first MP company, guard company, mm -hmm. and uh, we also used to work out with the infantry and stuff like that. You know. It was not like being in one place, you know, you were all over it. We made maneuvers 
uh, beach here. I'm trying Onslow Beach. Uh, it was just like a being in the infantry, but actually you were part of the headquarters. So what were your generally your duties as an MP? Well, later on, of course, it was to discipline the troops, but in the beginning it was nothing like that. I had nothing to do with it. Mm -hmm. Of course, you didn't get any liberty anyway. <laughs> you can go on liberty anyway. So uh, how long were you there? Overseas? Yeah, no, or there? In, uh, North Carolina. I'm trying to think. It's probably about eight, nine weeks, I guess, yeah. And after that, uh, what happened? We got uh, shipped up to, North, to New River, North Carolina. And we got into an outfit company, regular company there. Okay. And uh, we did maneuvers and stuff like that and worked us out all the time. Mm -hmm. And I forget exactly how long we were there, but we ended up in Norfolk, Virginia on the way over. I, I think I landed on Flag Day 40, it would be 42, June 14th in New Zealand. Did you know where you were going? Uh, we were nine nine tenths of the way over there before we found out. Okay. You were in the what, first Marine? First Marine or? Division. Yeah. They never told us. We just kept going. Twenty eight days straight aboard ship. Mm -hmm. Felt sorry for those guys. They ran out of cigarettes. I wasn't smoking. <laughs> uh, did you go cross country, or did you go down through the canal? Mm -hmm. Through the canal. Okay. Through the canal. What was that like? It was just part of the, uh, it goes through the canal, was nice to go through, but I mean, uh, after a while you're bored that ship so damn long, and, you know, if you're not, unless maybe if you're a sailor it doesn't bother you, but 28 days straight without seeing land at all, is, uh, it can get you, it can raw on your nerves after a while, you know. So you finally ended up in New Zealand? Yep, Wellington, uh, New Zealand. What was that like? Oh, that was a great place. What did you like about it? They were just very nice people, and... Um, uh, you know, they took us, they were very happy to see us too because it was a really, uh, you know, like a crisis time because they thought they were going to be invaded. So they treated us great and um, we worked, we worked out there and you know, did our training there and, and everything and then, and then we, uh, they brought some, by that time they hit Guadalcanal and they brought prisoners back and I had to go back to Guadalcanal for the guys that brought him back. Mm -hmm. Exact dates, I'm not sure. So you're part of the headquarters company? Yeah. Um, so after New Zealand... Came, so went to Guadalcanal. Guadalcanal. After Guadalcanal we came to Melbourne, Australia. And we had camp there. We worked out, trained there. And after that, we ended up going to uh, Cape Gloucester, New Britain, mm -hmm. and that was about a three-month campaign, I guess. It was just the weather was very bad there. It was it was bad enough, but it wasn't as bad as some other place. What was uh, Guadal backing up a minute? What was Guadalcanal like? It was just a big tropical island, and it was uh, you know there was times that were there wasn't enough food. You know, stuff like that. But uh, it was bigger than most places we ever landed on, you know. So was it uh, fairly secure by the time you were there? Well, when I came, when I came back, it was, it was not secure. But they, were, they had the bridge head up and they, nobody was getting through, you know. But it was not secure, by no means. You were guarding prisoners? We brought, we, they brought some back and we took the places of the guy that brought him back to New Zealand. We, took, we went back with them, okay. took over there. And what were, you, what were your duties on Guadalcanal? Like I said, uh, we were part of the, if they needed us in reserve, they called us up, you know, if they needed us. Mm -hmm. Not, we were there, going right around the airport, Henderson Field, guarding the airport. So uh, were the, uh, was the Japanese Navy coming down the slot? Yep. What was uh, that experience like at, at night? <laughs> it was very, that's the worst thing in the world here, is the shelling. Mm -hmm. The worst thing in the world. But they used to, they used to come in, after a while, even when they got the hell beat out of them, they would even send one plane in, you know? They used to call it washing machine Charlie. 
just so you couldn't sleep at night. And then went to, uh, like when I was in New Britain, they had lost most of their goddamn air, air force, mm -hmm. but they still managed to get two, three planes in every night to drop a bomb or two, you know. Basically to be a nuisance. That's right, because they, they knew that, that wasn't going to do anything, but they did it every night, mm -hmm. every night. So uh, on New Britain, what were you doing? Well, more or less, you know, like the same thing. Part of the part of the first MT company, mm -hmm. and uh, and we were always in reserve. Like, if you want to come, you need somebody, they ship us. Mm -hmm. There you go. So, what was uh, the regular Marines' view of the MP? Oh, we got along great. <laughs> we got along great. You know, the only time you ever had any trouble then was in this uh, Liberty Town. You know. And and if, and if you were and if you were the kind of a guy that wasn't a, you know, pain in the ass, you got along good with them too. You know, we got along great. Tell them about that uh, scene on New Britain. This one uh, with the uh, corpses. Oh, I was telling him that you know the, they had buried a lot of guys in, in Cape Gloucester, and after the, it rained like continuously maybe 10, 12 days straight without a stop. I guess the monsoon or whatever you call them. So they had to dig up the graves. And we used to be standing there on the roads. And they would go by with flatbed trucks and uh, they would have, you know, body after body after body. Just all, all you saw was the shoes hanging off the end of the thing. And of course, it was a terrible smell. I said, well, when the wasn't one of the nice things, you know. But you knew when that truck was coming, you know, you, you could smell it. But that was terrible weather there. It could rain 10 days like nothing. Is the disease a uh, problem? Well, I don't know. We, we were, uh, everybody was having trouble. Guys were getting malaria. But nothing uh, other than that that I can remember. Uh, I'm sure everybody had fungus up there. I mean, I even to this day suffer with it on my toes, my nail, toenail. They never grew back in right. But you were wet all the time. You were wet for 10 days straight. You know? There was no way you could get away from that fung jungle fungus. You know? what, what did you do uh, for recreation, if you had any, any leave time at all? We didn't have leave time. No. <laughs> when, we, uh, when we got there, I'm trying to see my mind is from the stroke. It's a little hazy. I think we went from Guadalcanal, went to Melbourne, Australia. Then we went to New Britain or Cape Gloucester. And then we, uh, we, we went to a little island called Pavuvu. That's where the headquarters was. Every, the whole division was there. And if you looked at it, it looked like a dream, you know, with the coconut trees and the When we got there, it was full of rats, jungle rats. It stunk like it be. It was an old plantation, actually, for Lever Brothers. But if you sat out in the bay and looked and you see these trees one after the other, you say, God, what a beautiful place, until you got ashore. And then we lived worse there than we did in the combat. I mean, it was terrible. I mean, it was nothing but mud and crap. But you know something? A few months after we got there, you should have seen that place. Well, they put everybody to work, just like you were uh, laborers or engineers or whatever you were. That place in a few months was beautiful. You could drive a truck in there and everything else. But up until that time, it was one of the worst things. Without combat, it was one of the worst places I ever saw. The smell was enough to kill you. You were in uh, Melbourne for how long? Oh, not exactly, but I think three, four months. Oh, how was that? Oh, it was beautiful. <laughs> we were, uh, of course, you ain't going to put this in there, but I told Bruce, they had been in the war before we even got in it. Before the, they got in the war, the women outnumbered the men anyway in the population. Now they took all the men and sent them to South Af or North Africa. The war in North Africa. So I don't want to go any further. It's okay. <laughs> Enough said. Um, now, after um, I 
Let's see, New Britain, Pavuvu, what the... This is when we went to Peladu, I think, after that. After New, after New Britain, we went to... That's right, we went to the Pavuvu, and then we went from there, we, we shipped off to... We went to New Guinea, like an overnight mm -hmm. gathering place, and then from there we went to Peladu. Did you, uh, when did you land on Palau? That the first day. Oh, you were? Yeah, yeah. Did Not the first wave. No. Okay. The first day. I was supposed to go in at something like 8 in the morning and 2 in the afternoon we were still going in. We finally got in that night. What was landing on that beach flight? <laughs> I was telling Bruce I almost converted. I was in a Higgins boat and I looked down the end of the thing. The place was erupting, you know. I looked down the end, and there was a, I could tell from the cross, it was a chapel, and he was doing a crucifix. And as we pulled in, the fire all stopped. And we went inside, and then it started right in again. I said, I think I'm going to convert. <laughs> I don't know what that guy was, but I think I'm going to convert. But that was a very, you know, that little place was unbelievable. Yeah. That was, uh, was that a... Holland Smith operation? No, no. no. Uh, well, our uh, our company commander was uh, or was Vandegrift. Um, then the guy, what was his name? I remember. Rupertus. Rupertus, General Rupertus. I told him. I always told Bruce a story. It's not nice. <laughs> Where they got word that they were getting they were getting beaten, but they were so dug in you couldn't do nothing. So what they decided to do was to uh, send five or six men, Japs did, in a boat come down the end of the island, it was only a six mile island, and assassinate the general. So that usually you get these rumors from intelligence, but they didn't mount it. It was all bullshit, you know. But this time the word comes through and sure enough they rang us around that CP like that. And sure enough in the morning, in they came. Just two of them came ashore, and I was telling Bruce, those guys must have weighed 100 pounds more than when they came in. They were so full of lead. Uh, it was un it was just unbelievable. But they took they took they figured that was going to change the whole thing if they had killed the general. What they're thinking was I don't know. But that was a tough island. Boy. I don't know whether people understand it. It was just as tough as. Tarawa, if not tougher. Mm -hmm. I think we lost something like 10,000 men. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so once you're ashore, what uh, you, you get involved in setting up the command post? No, we never stayed stayed too long. We'd, we'd, we'd ship out, you know. I'm, I'm trying to remember now. From there we went from Peladu. That's when I came home. That's right. Well, sure, I've been over two and a half years already. And uh, I got the word I was going out, and they went back to that. Remember, I told you that Pavuvu? We stayed there for a couple of weeks, got new clothes and stuff. The boat pulled in. I was, I went home. I was home during the war, while the war was on. That was quite an experience. How did that uh, come about? Well, if you had 20, we already had uh, 30 months. So they rotated you, you know. Okay. So our outfit was, was the first one over. We were, the, you know, at the head, the head of the first convoy that ever went, so we were the first ones to get back. It was like two and a half years later. Were they using the point system at that? No, no it might have been. I'm not sure, really sure how they did it. The Marine Corps is a little different than the Army, you know. It's what that general up there says, I think these guys have had enough or something like that, you know. Mm -hmm. But we knew that we had the word that we were going to go. We we're going to go back, and sure enough, we did. The, um, did your training uh, provide you with uh, <clears throat> what was a good training for your experience? I thought so. I thought so. You know, I look back it's quite a ways away, way back there. But I mean, you just I'll never, I'll never forget the time they brought a guy in from um, from the British Army. Did you ever hear of the, the raid on Dieppe? Yes. He had been in it. This guy for the British Army. 
and he came and he was going to teach us how to shoot from the hip. Everybody thinks, you know, you take that gun down here and you shoot. But what they did was they brought the guys in and they put tracer bullets in the gun and the target was behind was like a 200 foot cliff, right? So the guys would take the gun and you'd watch them, they'd be shooting over top of the goddamn mountain. Because it was not an easy thing to do, as people thought it was. Like John Wayne, you know. But, the, but they brought him in to train us. The training was just good. But it was quick. I know guys in the Army went in and didn't, didn't they trained for, for a year before they left. We didn't. We only had a few months. You know. The uh, Army training was uh, significantly different than the Marine training. Yeah, I guess so. Um, in what respect are you talking? Well, the way they would approach things. Oh. Uh, particularly thinking of Saipan, where Holland Smith relieved General Ralph Smith. Yeah. It appeared to be two different, a class between two different cultures and how to do things. Fortunately, at least from the Army's point of view, Holland Smith was in charge there. I remember him. Holland May, they used to call him Holland May. That's right, that's right. And uh, the New York State uh, National Guard was basically the 27th Division. Yeah. That was the uh, division the general was sacked. And, uh, yeah. He's uh, not a favorite. All right. Well, these guys, well, like I told Bruce, you know, Chesty Puller, I saw him every day. Really? Every day. Yeah. What would you think about? Him? Well, he he was strictly an enlisted man. Mm -hmm. He loved enlisted men, but he also loved combat. And the guys, a lot of the, I didn't ever fought on him, but a lot of guys that did said that, you know, they were a little leery of him because he he was never afraid of anything himself. So he couldn't assume that, you know, somebody else might be afraid of something. You know, mm -hmm. I, I was telling Bruce one day we were walking down the. Road, I think it was in Pavu after we'd been set up. And he's coming down, coming down this way. And he's going down the other way, and he, he, he's walking along there, and he sees two officers in the child line ahead of the enlisted men, which, according to the Marine Corps, is, doesn't happen. The enlisted men have to eat first, and he didn't give a shit. He enlisted guys walking on this side over here, and he cut loose at them screaming at them. You don't eat before your men get fed and boy. Those two guys, if they could have killed themselves, they probably would have done it right then and there. But he was a tough, he was a tough bugger. So uh, as part of a headquarters company, you were probably got, uh, you were around, around a lot of officers. Not a lot, but I, I remember, I knew, I saw Edson a lot. Mm -hmm. Do you ever remember him, Colonel Edson? What was he like? He was a, he never spoke to me. We didn't, he didn't say hi, Norm. <laughs> But uh, he looked like a real tough character. He was not too tall, round face, and uh, he always was very, always had a smile when he saluted, you know. Uh, apparently, this, I, I didn't know it at the time, but they tell me he actually won the Battle of Guadalcanal by his strategy. And I know he got the Congressional Medal of Honor, but I never knew what for until later. Any other officers um, come to mind? Of course, Rupertus himself. How was, what was he like? It was like he was somebody's grandfather. The nicest man you ever met here. He was very nice. I'm trying to, I didn't have too much to do with officers, but he came like when we let, when, uh, when we start, went home, he made like his farewell to the troops, you know? And he came over and um, he walked, just walked up and down, you know, he'd be, I don't know. Like we got those first Eisenhower jackets, you know, and he come over and he said to the guy, "How do you like the Eisenhower jacket?" Well, some of these rebels thought that you got to have a big spiel with. Him. All he wanted him to say was, "Yeah, it's good or bad," you know. So the guy said, "Well, you know, I don't like it," and I'm, and I could see the company commander wanted to kill himself. You know? And so the guy was a commandant of the Marine Corps, and this guy's telling him how bad the jacket is. But he was, you know, he just gave you the feeling that he, he really cared for his men. I mean, I didn't know him personally. We didn't have a big conversation. <laughs> well, how did you feel in general about the equipment? Well, of course, I, I didn't know what to compare it with. See, I had had no other training. 
I thought it was, you know, what we had was pretty good, but I hear later on that uh, that some of the things weren't so good. But how, what did I, how could I compare? I come over here and I, w I was in the service a few months and I'm overseas. You know? But I guess um, I, tr I, I uh, shot for a uh, record with a, no with, a th oath th uh, with a Springfield. Bolt action, which incidentally I didn't uh, qualify with. I was at about 10, 10 points short. And then before they even brought the Garand in, you know. And then they had these little carbines, 30 caliber carbines, small what, 30s. What did you generally carry as a... I had a pistol, a what 45? you call it, 45, and I had a carbine, small carbine. And actually they were... For distance, they were not too good. You know, up close, they were good. But if you had somebody off about 100 yards or 150 yards, that wind was blowing, you weren't going to hit them. <laughs> but then, I think comparatively speaking with the Japs, the stuff was just as good, if not better. You know? So generally, living conditions were what, like what in the islands? Most of the time, they were, they were pretty tough. They were pretty tough with weather and things like that, and um, I thought they were. Everybody else did too. Food adequate? It's, uh, there were times when it wasn't. There were other times when there was plenty. When it, you know, if they were there a while, there was plenty. But in the beginning, there wasn't. In fact, I when I went to Paris Island, they only had one dish and one fork and one spoon for you. Yeah, and if you if they put something in the middle of the table, you better dig in and get it with everything in one dish, or you wouldn't get it. That's how early that was. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But uh, they usually had good mess sergeants who, uh, who finagled their ways through and found ways for you to eat. You know, uh, I found out, of course, whenever they had a chance to. to uh, really take time to find out something fine for you to eat, you always get the best. No, they did. What were the non-coms like? Well, some of them were good and some of them, I hate to say there were some southern, southern guys that uh, they wouldn't even talk to us when we came in the out. Really? They were like the Civil War was going on, you know. Of course, things changed. The first shot was fired. Everything changed. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Suddenly became their buddy, you know. But before that, they were very. Some of them were very aloof. They'd been in a whole year. You were a vet. You were a rookie. They were veterans, you know. And there was a lot of that stuff going on. Any religious discrimination? I never saw anything. Oh, the only thing I had. See, I'm Jewish, mm -hmm. and we had a, a first sergeant, which in those days was more or less like a clerk. And they used to give them a bad time. Well, they didn't with me because the guy that, who eventually became the heavyweight champion of the division was a friend of mine. We used to work out every day with the gloves, every chance we had. So they didn't give me too much tr trouble. But they used to give him a little, uh, a little trouble. Mm -hmm. But uh, I, I never had any. I never had any. Just once. One time and I squelched that. <laughs> The, um, you were, uh, let's see, any, um, any recreation while you were? Well, wait, we, we left Melbourne, there wasn't a, none of that stuff, you know. Mm -hmm. While we were in Melbourne, there was really a, Hell of a place to go on vacation. Really? <laughs> yeah. You got along pretty well with the Australians? Oh yeah, yeah. Um, like I've told, I've told my son many times. They'd been in the war a few years before we even got in it, and before the war, the, the women outnumbered the men anyway. How do you know what's going to happen now? The, uh, how'd you get along with the army? I never had any any problems with them. Uh, I never ran into them too much. Mm -hmm. Never so long. Had a few scuffles with Navy guys. You know. Oh, really? Oh, we used to lay on board, lay out in the deck, you know. We were, I was on 12, 13 ships, you know. Mm -hmm. 
and we'd lay out on the deck and they'd come along and, you know, they, with that hose to clean the deck and they just make sure they got you, you know. So it used to be a couple of fist fights for that stuff, but not, not the service. So the, um, the first division commander was, was Vander? Vandergrift. Vandergrift. Yeah. Then Rupertus went to, was in charge of Pelulu. Okay. Yeah. Uh, did you ever get to see Vandergrift? I saw you. Yeah, I met him uh, when, he, uh, when he left. He came over and checked the troops out in Melbourne. He was really like a, somebody's grandfather, really a nice man. But he, he had to be good because he wouldn't be there. When he, he was coming home to become the commandant. Well, the officers were pretty well thought of in general? Well, the, especially the higher officers, like Lieutenant Colonel on up. Mm -hmm. Yeah. There were some other ones that, you know, they were what they called 30 Day Wonders, you know, or whatever he called in those days. Mm -hmm. Some of them were not that popular, but uh, they were mixed too, you know. Uh, but you take the higher ones, I mean, uh, there's something about them that, I think I told Bruce one day the first, we first landed in uh, New Britain, and he got word that I don't know how many planes had taken off from Rabaul to, to bomb us, and they were coming in. And this one lieutenant colonel up there, he's not a young guy either. And he's walking around, all right, get in the hole. Get, you get over here, get behind them. Like he was in a Sunday school picnic, you know. Uh, and sure enough, but the only thing is, they started out with 80 and only four made it through. And they straight the shit out of us with those four. But it was like, he wasn't, he wasn't phased at all that they were coming, you know. So Some the, of the higher ups were, were very good. Uh, so the problem tended to be more company level. Never really had any any troubles, you know. The little the little I ever had was, you know. The only story I ever really had was when, after the war was over. Tell us about that. Well, I was in out in California on the way out again when the war ended, and. Uh, I was there for a week, and before that, I, uh, I'd been somehow or other had no liberty, and so I walked into this first sergeant. And I said to him, uh, "Can I get a? I think it was a, they used to get advance money if you had it coming, and a week a week off." He said, "No," and he says, "For bothering me." He said, "You got the duty again this week." Sergeant of and I walked out the door, and there was a sign by Howland Mad Smith, your friend. It says, "All men of the Jewish faith." It was Yom Kippur. Could have the weekend off, so I turned right around and walked back in. I said, "I'm not going to do the duty this weekend." <laughs> and he said, "What the hell do you mean?" I said, "Well, you go tell the general." Well, he heard that, of course, and got all the shit. <laughs> but that was one of the few victories I had in my life. <laughs> But I'm sure it was very sweet. It was, <laughs> because I don't know what the, I did see, I'd been taken away from my old outfit out there. I was strange. I was with a different company altogether. The war was over, you know. So they used to, they used to take advantage of us, you know. So you were with the, <clears throat> the original company up until that point? Right to the very, almost the very end. What was the camaraderie like? Well, you know, it was a lot of good ones. A lot of, there were, there were some, I thought that the old enlisted guys, you know, the lower enlisted, were really very close. Mm -hmm. I thought, I had told my son a couple of times, I thought I would never lose track of these guys. We lived on them for four years straight, you know. But you do, you lose, you lose track. You, you don't go to reunions? What was, I think that went to one, one reunion, yeah. And one day I got a, on my, guy that I was very close with, I got on the phone, he lived in Little Falls, New York, and I called him up. I hadn't spoken to him in 15 years. I thought he was going to faint when I called him. But, uh, you know, you lose, see, everybody says, well, you're friends now, you'll be friends forever. You're sure you're friends, but everybody's life is different. You, you go your way, I go mine.
So when you got back to the States, um, how long was it before you got to uh, Australia? I think it was almost immediately. I can, you know, I don't have these, uh, I don't have these things right down. You came back to... I got a 30-day leave. And like I say, I was on my way out to, to California. I was out in California for a little while. Then they called me back to North Carolina. I got this charge there. Then you went back to Poughkeepsie? Back home. And what did you do? Well, I went back to work for Central Hudson for the, the utilities. Right yeah. away? Yeah, they took me right back. And after, uh, how long did you work for them? Well, about a year after that, and then uh, eventually I got into my own, my own business. Mm -hmm. uh, I used to have a, a route where I would go around all the taverns and restaurants and sell them stuff right off the truck. Lime juice, grenadine, potato chips, and stuff like that. I did that for a lot of years. A lot of years. Never got rich, but I made a good living. Had a family? Well, this Bruce, and I lost his son. 20. How old was that one? He was 19. 19 when he, when he died. So we, and my wife was sick today. So. The, uh, it didn't turn out, you know, that, that respect. He's had the brunt of the whole thing. You know. So what, uh, is there an overriding uh, thought about your experience in the service? Tell them that story that uh, when you examine that uh, dead Japanese. Oh, story. yeah, well, you know, I, I think I told you that they got word that time uh, that the Jap was, they were coming down there. So I was right by where he died, right by that hole he fell into. So this is a very nice <laughs> first part of it. He laid down, he was laying head first with his fanny sticking up. You know, Marines are sort of vulgar guys, you know. And this one guy says, first of all, he says, just right for pogging. <laughs> and I looked up and there was a reporter standing right at the thing there, an old man. You know? And I, I told, told Bruce, I jumped in there and I pulled his wallet out. And here was this guy's picture, this chap, with two, with his wife and two, three young kids. Just, you know, and at the time I told him, it didn't mean nothing to me. But as time went on, I've thought about this. This, this guy was just like everybody else. And he went out there and got himself chopped up for nothing, you know. It was almost like a suicide. They knew it was like suicide to do this. And there's one guy I want you to find out about. I told Bruce about it. Uh, I was sitting on... Tell that story. Yeah, out in Britain. I was sitting on the side of the road. I don't know why I was doing there. I look back on it now. Whether I was supposed to have a, d a guard duty there or what it was. And this guy comes walking down the road. He's all dressed with high, beautiful boots. And I thought at first it was an officer. So the guy sits next, down to, uh, next door, uh, next to me, and he says... Uh, I don't. Yeah. Well, he says I got. I think he said I got my twenty-first job today. I said, Oh shit! This guy thinks I just come over with the last boat. He's gonna. Yeah. I said, How'd you do that? He says, I said, Choked him to death. So anyway, we got talking. I'm sitting there listening to him, and all he's going through my mind: This guy thinks I've just come over in the last boat. But you know something? I came home and picked up a Chevron, which is a Marine newspaper, and there was his picture. Have you ever heard of the Getchy Patrol in Guadalcanal? There was 21 guys went down to pick up Jap prisoners who were supposed to want to surrender, and they went down there and they were ambushed, and they killed all but one guy, and his brother was one of those those guys that was killed, and he made a vow that he was going to get one Jap for every one of those guys. And that day that I ran into him and sat with him that day, and I looked at him and I thought to myself, Jesus, is this guy bullshit me? Or? But when I come home, I find his picture in the Chevron. The guy was telling me no lies. He had killed a Jap for every one of that patrol. He got one Jap. Was he an enlisted man? Yeah. He was with the what they call the recon outfit, 
and the Japs were, they were, you know, retreating, and he would be out in front there looking for them. That's what he was, he had made up his mind to go get them. And I would like to, I was telling Bruce, I would like to get some way I could get. If you know of a resource where we can, we might be able to. Find that guy's name. I oh, should have yeah. written it well, down, you know. I should have. Because apparently it's, a, it's an incident in the Guadalcanal Diary, the book. Yeah, it's, it's the, the part I'll about the raid is there, yeah. I can give you a name of a guy you can kind of yeah. Afterwards, okay, we're, yeah. we're down to 30 seconds. Um, Summarizing your well, book? you know, you can look back on it now and say, well, you know, I wouldn't have missed it for the world because it was, it was I went to places I'd have never gone to before, but there were some bad times, but there were a lot of good times too, you know, so what the hell can I tell you? Would you have done it again? Oh, I, I believe so. We were very patriotic in my day. When they dropped that thing there, they, you know what I mean, nobody would believe that they could, they would do it to us, you know. If they hadn't done that, chances are half the guys would never have been in the service. Half of them. Not more. They've been in. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Well, I thank you, sir. It was great. Yeah.